Hello, my name is Dan Dulligans. I am a senior circuit design engineer for the Portland Technology Development Division of Intel Corporation. We're located in Portland, Oregon. I have the pleasure of sharing with you a presentation entitled I a High Performance Low Power Pentium Processor. The co-authors of this presentation are Doug Carmine and Larry Clark, also of Portland Technology Development Intel, and Robert Rosblock, who recently left our group. The specific processor which I'll be speaking about is the Pentium 9100. The Pentium 9100 is an implementation of the Pentium 66, 60, 6066 architecture onto uh, Intel's next generation process. It was a major goal of our team to add enhancements to the Pentium architecture that would solidify the Pentium as the architecture of choice for the entire range of system applications meaning all the way from laptops completely through to high-end servers. With that goal in mind, I'll be sharing with you some enhancements which at first may seem not quite to go together, but are cemented by that one particular design goal. Those being low power through power management techniques and enhancements for high performance through glueless dual processing. The outline of my presentation is as follows. I'll begin by talking about those power management techniques, and I'll share with you some power measurements that we made in our laboratory, and then I'll finish with the glueless dual processing. Power management is very important to the redesign of the Pentium. What we've been able to do through the incorporation of our power management techniques is to give higher performance yet reduced power. This in turn contributes to reducing the cost of the system and of our packaging. This is very important, for example, to the emerging notebook market. In notebooks, power is essentially everything. Most directly, it affects the size of the notebook and it affects the battery life, two of the very most important parameters. I will begin by talking about the macro states which we added to the Pentium 9100 design. These are stop clock, auto halt, and standby. These are software and system usable and are very visible. Then I will begin talking about some other power management techniques which aren't quite as visible. For example, IO trap restart is still software system usable, but it's not quite as noticeable. And then clock throttling, which we do internal to the chip, isn't noticeable from the outside at all. This particular slide shows the power states of the Pentium 9100, which we've added in a classical state diagram. The top oval represents the normal operating state of the part from which you may move into either stop clock or auto halt power modes. The stop clock power mode is gotten into by asserting the stop clock pin, and you move back into normal mode from stop clock by deasserting that pin or initiating a reset, se reset sequence. From normal operation, you can move into auto halt. You do this by having the operating system issue a halt instruction. Basically, any halt instruction will move the processor from normal state into the auto halt state, and you can get back through any external interrupt or reset sequence. The third power state is the standby power state. This is a sub-state of the stop clock state. You get there by simply turning off your external clock, and you get back to stop clock by turning it on. So I'll spend a little bit more time now on each of these states now that you know sort of how they flow and get uh, how you move from one to the other. Stop clock, as I mentioned, is system usable, and you get in and out of it by asserting or deasserting the stop clock pin. The stop clock pin will cause a level triggered interrupt to the processor, which is dealt with at a very low priority. Essentially, we're going to deal with everything else before we're going to deal with this stop clock interrupt. It's important to recognize that during the stop clock power mode, snooping of our caches is going on all the time. This means that the memory coherency of the system is being maintained. Auto halt is a totally analogous state to stop clock. And that's why in the state diagram they're kind of parallel to each other. Auto halt behaves exactly like stop clock, as you'll see in a slide that's coming up. The same things are basically happening inside of the chip. And in both power modes, you're burning less than a watt at 100 megahertz. And in auto halt, just like in stop clock, snooping is again being uh, maintained, so your data coherency is being maintained. The big difference in auto halt is how you get in and out of it compared to how you got in and out of stop clock. Again, you get into auto halt by executing a halt instruction. The auto halt state, however, is going to generally replace 
polling conditions, these tight loops that the processor could be put in looking for um, coming out of an idle state. You go into a big loop and you're waiting for some activity to occur. That's a very high power state. Your caches are running. Um, your instruction units are running. Instead, we could replace it with the auto halt state, which will, in a sense, be an interrupt driven state. And you'll come out of it as soon as an interrupt occurs rather than sitting and polling and wasting power. So that's kind of a, a preview to exiting auto halt. Like I just said, you can get out of it through any external interrupt. So a, a non maskable interrupt or an init or a reset will all bring you out. There are three other ways you can come out of auto halt that aren't quite as obvious. The first is a flush. If the processor encounters a flush, then the clocks will be started up, the data will be invalidated in the caches, and the necessary data may be written back out. A system management interrupt will also put the processor back into the normal operating state from auto halt, but this will depend upon the setting of a flag out in system management memory space. And the other way that you can come out of auto halt that's not quite as obvious is through the run stop pin. This pin will operate just like the normal debug run stop pin of the Pentium during an auto halt state. So you can work just like you would in normal for during debug. This foil shows the activity that's occurring both during both stop clock and auto halt. As you can see, all the power hungry circuits on the chip are basically shut down. It means the caches are shut down, your prefetch buffers, your branch target buffer, your floating point unit, all that turned off. You're not using it. However, the data in the instruction cache, they have their tag comparators turned on so that we can, again, do the snooping of our caches to maintain our memory coherency. Our APIC unit is turned on so we can be paying attention to interrupts, and the bus unit is turned on to support both of those. Standby mode, as I mentioned, is a sub-power mode of stop clock. During standby mode, you're burning very little power. We're talking microamps. You get there again by turning off the external clock and you turn it back on to get out of it. Standby mode is intended to support all the laptop designs out there that have the suspend mode, where when the user closes the laptop and walks away, we'll go into standby mode, burning microamps, and thus saving battery. So that's the, the power modes that we added. We also added support of IO trap restart. IO trap restart is a scheme where we allow the peripheral devices of the system to go to sleep when they're not idle, and when they are idle, when they're not being used. Excuse me. Um, if the processor issues a request to one of these peripherals that's asleep, what happens is that the system will generate a system management interrupt and go into its system management handler. The processor will also go off into a handler. And during this time, the system management handler will go off into uh, system management memory and write the IO restart slot flag. So then when the CPU comes back out of its handler and sees this flag, it knows to go ahead and restart the I.O. instruction that caused the peripheral to be hit that was asleep. So that is very visible still. And the next step is really invisible. This has to do with selectively shutting down the clocks of power hungry units inside the chip when we're not using them. We do this specifically with two units, our caching units and our floating point units. We could do this in the caches because we always know one cycle ahead of time that we're going to need a cache. So we recognize we're going to need it. We power them up. It's there for us. Now, I shouldn't say that this is always deterministic. There are a few cases where we can't be certain that we need the caches. We always take the conservative approach and power up the caches in those cases. What this means is that there's absolutely no latency in the scheme. There's absolutely no performance hit. The caches are always ready when we need them. This is an extreme power savings when you recognize that your caches are using a high degree of analog circuitry and self-time circuitry, which when you're clocking them, you're burning a considerable amount of power. And if you're not using the caches, it doesn't make any sense. The floating point unit is much the same, except that we assume that the floating point unit is normally off. Then there will be three conditions upon which we'll turn the floating point unit on. First of these is when a floating point instruction is decoded. You're in the decode stage of the pipe. You recognize that a floating point instruction is coming your way. So we're anticipating. Remember, the execution stage is down the pipe. So we'll have the floating point unit on, ready when we need it. Again, there will be no latency, no performance hit, because we're anticipating. A natural extension of this is if there's a floating point instruction already in the pipe, then 
leave the floating point unit on. The third case isn't quite as obvious. This is when a floating point exception occurs. When a floating point exception occurs, the machine will go into its floating point exception handler. The floating point exception handler is comprised entirely of integer instructions. What this means is if you use the two rules which I just presented, the floating point unit would be turned off. This won't work because you're going to need to execute that floating point instruction which caused the exception immediately upon leaving the handler. So in that case, a floating point exception, we also leave the floating point unit up and running. And again, for both the caches and the floating point, there's no latency, there's no performance hit, there's just power savings. So where does all this get us? The next two foils I'm going to show you are real power measurements that we made in our lab. We did this by buying commercially available systems and going down and measuring them. These are design engineers doing these measurements. These aren't systems that were built for this purpose. Uh, this particular slide shows a data table. It uh, shows the average power, minimum power, and maximum power of various operating systems with a typical user running typical applications on them. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because it's pretty self-explanatory, but I think I will point out the advantages that AutoHalt has given us here. If you look at the second two rows, the middle two rows, so the second row and the third row, you'll notice that they're labeled DOS Windows with and without Power.exe. For those of you who are not familiar with Power.exe, it is a DOS driver which senses when things are idle, and rather than sitting in that tight pulling loop that I spoke about, issues a halt instruction to the processor. Again, in the Pentium 9100, that'll put us into the auto halt state. So when you're running with power.exe, you're essentially running with auto halt. And when you're running without it, you're running in this tight polling loop I spoke about. If you look at just average power there, you'll see that there's a one watt savings over that, over a 30% savings by running with auto halt. The next uh, slide shows this a little bit differently. What's going on here is what we've deemed a typical instruction mix. Starting on the left of the slide, we're booting DOS and going into Windows. Then there's a slight idle period. And then we run Indio. We do a video clip. From there, we moved into Excel, scrolled around on a spreadsheet a little bit, and did some recalculations. This uh, graph is very important for comparing maximum and minimum power with and without Power.exe again. The top line is the processor running without Power.exe, and the bottom line is running with Power.exe. And if you look at the mins and the maxes, what you'll notice is that with Power.exe, with auto halt, you're burning less than, say, half a watt during those idle times. And without it, you're burning over four watts. Now, I'd like to point out something very important here when looking at this graph. The time base is based on just one of those CPU run times through. Again, this is in a design lab. We're using a different driver. We have a user that may be reacting just a little bit different to this application. So what you're trying to do is line up events, not time sequences. For, for example, I can't say at 13 seconds into this flow exactly the same thing is happening in both processors. But what I can do is I could definitely look at this plot and compare the idle times, the flat space on the bottom graph and the top flat peak up there, and look at maximum minimum. So that concludes what I was talking about in terms of power management enhancements we made to the Pentium 9100. Now let's move into the major performance enhancement that we made in the Pentium 9100. That is glueless dual processing. Our dual processing scheme is system level compatible with the uniprocessor architecture, and in so doing achieves 1.5 the performance of a uniprocessor system when it's running threaded applications. Now every time I say that, people ask me, well, is there any performance hit when you're not running threaded applications? Well, yes, there is. In the dual processor system that we've implemented, both processors are fully symmetrical. That means they are both fully capable. So you have a normal throughput um, advantage here when one processor is running one application and say the other is running a different one. You'll just naturally get more throughput in your system. By maintaining system level compatibility with the unit processor system, you'll see that we were also able to achieve a dual processing system at a very low cost. Our requirements for the dual processing system were really fairly simple. The major one was that the two processors had to appear as a single processor to the memory bus controller. So that means that they had to work together and in so interact totally transparent to the rest of the system so that the rest of the system believes there's only one processor there. To keep the cost to, minimi to minimize the cost, 
we also made the requirement that we would use the same chipset as being used in a single processor system, thus minimizing the cost of the system. So now having said a little bit about what the dual processing architecture is all about, let's talk a little bit about how it works. At restart, there is a handshake that goes on between the two processors across two pins. The first pin is used for the second processor to tell the first, hey, I'm here. And then the other pin is used to transmit a serial message which explains what the processor is that's present there and how they're going to play together. The second processor then will essentially become idle until the first processor issues what we call an interprocessor interrupt to the second processor. This is done across the private interface and will not be seen at all by the system and it is provided at a very low level operating system level such as the uh, Unix kernel or NT HAL. So the processors now are up and awake and they've recognized that each, one other one, each other is there. So now how are we going to deal with the fact that our one uh, processor looking constraint on the system? How are we going to deal with this? Because that means there's only one system bus. So we have to have a way to arbitrate who owns the bus between the two processors without the rest of the system seeing it. So again we have a private interface across which the two will talk and we define two states which each processor may be in. One processor will be the most recently used bus master, or the MRM, if you will. The other processor will be the least recently used bus master, or the LRM, if you will. If the LRM needs the bus, it will request of the MRM. The MRM owns the bus. And then the two will switch roles when that's acknowledged. The LRM will become the MRM. The MRM becomes the LRM. So it's a role switching. Again, both processors are totally symmetrical. They're both equally capable. It's simply a state that we define each one of them to keep track of who owns the bus. Well, we decided that we wanted to support the complete Pentium bus architecture. What this means is we wanted to allow both inter and intra pipeline cycles on the bus. To do this, we defined two more states. We call them ICP states or inter CPU pipeline states. With the addition of these two states, what we can now do is allow the MRM to issue a cycle off onto the bus, receive an NA back from the system saying, hey, it's OK to go ahead and pipeline. And then either the MRM or the LRM at that point may submit another cycle to the bus and pipeline it. Everything will come back serially. There's enough states there going on that we keep track of it. And we go gracefully on our way, just like there was one processor there. Now, I've kind of simplified that a little bit. Um, it's not just a state game. There's a little bit more involved. The two processors, again, have to behave like one. So if there's a, an A hold, a hold, or a back off, we have to save off a lot of information so that the two processors may gracefully get out of those cycles and then resubmit them when the proper time comes along. So that's how we deal with uh, the bus arbitration. The next foil shows a pictorial connection of the bus arbitration interconnection. You notice at the top of the foil, there are two red lines there. That's the private interface. Those two, bin, two pins, uh, PB request and PB grant, are used to switch between LRM and MRM, the two processors determining who's got the bus. The rest of the connections are the standard Pentium bus connections. You'll notice that they go to both processors. So it's, the system is simply hooked up exactly the same way as it was before. It's just that the signals are going to two processors rather than one. What this allows is total unified control, total unified appearance to the system bus of the two processors. They look like one again. So that's bus arbitration. We also have a problem of cache coherency. How are we going to deal with keeping the caches coherent without the system even knowing that it's going on? Our caches use the messy protocol to enforce cache co 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 consistency. Um, to do this between the two processors, the LRM will continually snoop the bus activity of the MRM. If the LRM has the data that's needed, it'll tell the MRM and they'll switch roles. When an external inquire cycle occurs, it'll be the MRM which will respond. So in that way, there is only one unified response from the two processors to the system during snooping. In addition to arbitration and the caches, how do you deal with interrupts? In our redesign of the Pentium, we moved the APIC processor on board, the Advanced uh, Processor Interrupt Controller. 
What this allows is for both processors, again, to be totally symmetrical. They are both equally capable of handling interrupts. Interrupts could be directed at one CPU by the operating system, or they may use the normal load balancing uh, techniques so that whichever process dr processor drops its priority low enough first, that'll be the one that handles the interrupt. So again, it's a scheme which looks totally like a uniprocessor system to the system. So that concludes my presentation. In summary, I could say that the incorporation of our power management techniques has enabled the Pentium 9100 to achieve roughly one-fifth the power consumption of its predecessor at a higher performance level. This makes the Pentium the clear choice for not only desktop designs, but also for the power-weary power laptop designs. At the same time, the addition of the glueless DP architecture to the Pentium 9100 has provided a performance with threaded applications that's over 1.5 times that of a uniprocessor system when running threaded applications without significant added cost. This in turn makes the Pentium the clear choice for performance-oriented markets such as desktop MP systems and high-end servers. Thank you.